So my name is Nancy Adasi and I, I have the joy to welcome this panel with me. Um, first we have Andrew from What If Media Group and we have Noah from Invoca and we have Ty from TapJoy. And the first thing that I want to do is give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and so we can learn more about what they do and then we'll go right into the panel. Andrew, do you want to start us off? Sure, I'm Andrew Playman. I am from What If Media Group. I'm a VP of Business Development. Been in the space for probably 15 years now. Uh, what If Media Group, we own and operate 14 different sites. Uh, what we do is we bring in a user and we bring them down a whole flow for uh, lead generation. Uh, we can target the user in any way. Uh, we are very big email marketers. Uh, we do a lot of push notifications, SMS, and on-site registrations. Uh, our biggest uh, thing that we can do for anyone is target a user and get you the right customer. Cool. I'm Noah I'm Fields, uh, not Tanya Rodriguez. Unfortunately, her flights got canceled. She couldn't make it. Um, I'm with Invoca. I've been with Invoca for about five years now. We're a, a call tracking and call analytics company. We also provide technology for paper call. And we've been around for about 10 years and traditionally focused on the performance marketing space, specifically paper call. And over that time, we transitioned from not just doing paper call, but also doing call tracking and analytics for large enterprise brands. And so today we live in both worlds and anything to do with um, inbound phone calls and tracking for those, that's where we live. Awesome. I'm Ty Davidson. I'm 15 years in the affiliate marketing space. I'm six years with TabJoy. And for those who don't know, TabJoy is a gaming platform. We are a global company. We have seven offices around the world. Um, we are all mobile, all in sent. Um, users are, our users engage with brands and products in exchange for virtual currency or free content. So brands and um, direct advertisers look to us when they want to scale, when they want to scale quickly. Um, performance has been a huge proponent of our business. Um, and we're steadily growing. Very good. And of course, I'm Nancy Adasi. I'll be leading this panel. I founded a consulting firm called Adasi, Adasi Consulting. And what we do is basically we do marketing for policy researchers. And we work uh, with the United Nations extensively in the United States as well. So we're going to jump right into it. And first of all, I'd like for all of you to tell us about what marketing channels you consider yourself experts in. Sure. Uh, Basically, email marketing is one of the biggest uh, channels that we work in. Uh, we bring in around 300,000 registrations a day and 280,000 come from email. Email is always the best quality. Um, another big one for us is on-site lead generation. And as I said earlier, we can target the user any way. So if you're looking for a user that owns a home and you know, has debt, we can find that user for you, as well as uh, we work with a lot of brands. For example, Norwegian Cruise Line. If you're, we build a newsletter list for them. So anyone looking to go on a cruise, uh, what we do is we post them an email address, first name, last name, and they get you onto their newsletter list. Another big, and it's a newer one, is push notifications. Push notifications has turned into a very big business. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one I would say is SMS marketing. SMS, you know, in my opinion, is email marketing from 2003 right now. So it's very big. You can do, you know, you can do regular sites as well as apps as well as paper call that you know me and Noah were talking about earlier. Yeah, and connected to that, um, for me, the main main focus or my main expertise would be in the paper call space, and then also in working with what our clients focus on. Um, which is also connected to the phone calls, but it would be more direct response marketing. So uh, prints, TV, radio, that type of thing. For me, I kind of fit in with both of these guys in that I manage our affiliate partnership and development um, aspect of our business. Um, you know, again, our platform is more or less brand or in-app focused, but we do also um, work with lead gen companies, lead gen partners. Um, some of my biggest partners in the affiliate space are those guys who are looking for, you know, first page email submits, um, you know, just a simple lead registration or a, a purchase. Um, but I've also worked with guys um, in Noah's space on the paper call side 
side where they're just looking to uh, push a, a lead or, or turn a lead into a call, um, drive that through a call center. I've actually worked with Andrew um, in some past incarnations um, in terms of like email and um, lead gen. Um, our platform is 100% incentivized. We do, you know, we make that known to our partners because you know, if you're familiar with brands or agencies, you know, incent is the bad word, um, but they're slowly um, and, 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 but also, you know, beginning to recognize that there is a value in an, in, um, an incentivized user um, because you know our platform is all mobile. People are more likely to engage with something on their phone because it's in their face and it's in their hands at all times. And so, you know, our team, we've done a very good job of, you know, just kind of giving that data and giving those facts to our brand partners, our agency partners. And then we do small testing so they can actually see the return on their investment. Um, so, you know, from a user acquisition perspective, you know, we're winning the game, but on the performance side, we're definitely killing the game. Um, and, you know, there have been some recent changes with Apple um, as it relates to, you know, in-app purchasing, um, through iOS devices. Um, and so now we're seeing a focus shift more so from that, like that in-app activity and people are still moving over into like a mobile, a web browser based type of experience. And those results are still like, just like, just kicking behind, if I can say that, to be polite about it. Uh, but we definitely see a need for more affiliate marketing in our space and particularly through mobile clients and for those who are looking to buy um, and incentivize placements. And, and I think for you, Ty, I want you to take a few minutes and just explain exactly what affiliate marketing is for those of us in the audience who may not be quite familiar with it. Please. Okay, so affiliate marketing is more or less just you know third-party partnership arrangements um, or agreements, I should say, between an advertiser um, and a publisher. Um, so we're more like the middle guy. So if I have a, um, an advertiser partner, you know, who typically buys through agency, who typically work or work through agencies, um, you know, for whatever reason the agency can't fulfill all of the needs, so they'll work with a third party or work through a third party. So that's where affiliate comes in. Um, that's what I specialize in. But affiliate is such a broad term because there are more than 300 plus affiliate networks in the space. Everyone's specializing in something different. There are some guys who focus only on email marketing. There are some who focus only on lead gen. There are some who focus only on paper call. Um, but you know, it's all third party relationships. Um, and again, it's designed to connect a brand with a user through what might be considered non-conventional means for our particular space. Okay. You know, a, lot, a lot of people think affiliate is a dirty word, um, as well as incent, as, as you said before. Affiliate is everywhere. You know, I just ran the Amazon affiliate program to sign someone up for, you know, for Prime. So you go to ProFlowers, you go to 1-800-Flowers, you go to Amazon, you go to Target, they all have affiliate programs. You know, affiliate networks sometimes people think is, you know, dirty words, mm -hmm. but it's everywhere. Every single big company has an affiliate program. If it's on a percent, if it's on, you know, on a lead or whatever it is, it's, it's huge. Okay. And Noah, do you want to talk a little bit about pay per call and what you do on a daily basis? Yeah, so <clears throat> paper calls a type of affiliate marketing where um, instead of you know paying for a lead form or paying for a sale, you'll pay on a, a per call basis. So really, any um, any type of company that or certain verticals that are really good for phone calls would be things like home services, financial services, um, insurance, really anything that would be a considered purchase where a consumer would prefer to talk to someone and convert over the phone versus fill out something online, so anything that's expensive or complicated. Um, in the paper call space, there's, you know, there's a, a wide breadth of verticals beyond that, but those are some of the, the biggest areas where calls are relevant. Um, and then same way that other affiliate programs work, you know, the third party generates that call for the brand. Mm -hmm. The brand um, pays them on a, usually on a duration basis or some other kind of relevant uh, metric for a quality phone call. And that's how the, the model works on the paper call side. And Invoca facilitates that from a tracking perspective, um, making sure that all partners know um, how many calls were sent, what quality calls were sent, and who owes people what. Okay. Did you want to add something? Yeah. I'm good. So for the panel itself, and any of you can start, why should brands expand past Google and Facebook ads? 
Yeah, I'll start this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta diversify. I mean, yeah, everyone knows Google. It's the biggest ad network out there, right? But it's a black box sometimes. Um, yeah, if you're working with myself, you can do small tests, you can optimize, you can figure out which users you wanna work with. Google and Facebook, they're obviously amazing. We all use them, but you wanna have different levels of you know, driving customers to your sites. Mm -hmm. um, for me, there's so much more that you know, my company can do um, by posting an email, a phone number, uh, getting a call in that you're gonna be competing on Google and spend a lot more money. I can echo that. Um, you know, honestly, our biggest competitor um, is Facebook, to be, to be perfectly honest about that. And I think what most of our partners are looking at is, you know, scale. And so when you think Facebook, when you think Google, you think reach, you think scale, you think, as Andrew just pointed out, everyone uses them, we all use them. But I think the missing piece for those guys is that, you know, the analytics are important. Um, and, you know, from a data science perspective, you know, a lot of the feedback that we get um, from our partners who might buy or who have bought traditionally from Facebook or Google, but now they're buying from Tabjoy, they, you know, they want that input. Okay, so how is how does this user become more quality for me? How do I hit my KPI with this user through your platform? So we're able to optimize, we're able to drill down, we're able to answer those specific questions because it's not about just getting that customer, it's about keeping them. But at the same time, it only takes one bad deal or one bad experience to just kind of like kill the business, you know, or to kill that repeat business. And I think for us, you know, we have a full-fledged business intelligence team, we have a full-fledged data science team to where, you know, when our clients come back with those hard questions, we can answer whether it's tracking, whether it's, you know, is this particular device ID um, able to be passed back to me, whatever the question is. And I think, you know, because Facebook and Google are just so ginormous, those small things sometimes slip through the cracks, but those small things are what most clients are really looking for at the end of it. Yeah, just, I think there's a lot of opportunity outside of those two big giant platforms is, you know, a lot of us here are in the performance marketing space, so we know the affiliate channel can be really valuable. And to echo these guys, there's, just, there's a lot more, there can be a lot more transparency with the right partners on the performance side. And you can really focus in and hone in on certain types of customers because of that. Okay. And I, I always tell um, a lot of brands and a lot of businesses, you know, you, not everybody uses Facebook and Google all the time. There are people out there in your customer segments that you know will, you would benefit from using pay per call, that you would benefit from using on site lead generation. So that's really important, like Andrew said, to diversify as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So for you guys, when do you think is the right time for brands and businesses <laughs> to start uh, going to you guys for marketing or start using pay per call or start using? Affiliate marketing. Yeah, I mean, we, we were talking about this earlier, yeah. and you know, the right time is right now. I mean, yesterday, you know, right, right away. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were we were we were laughing at her before, but someone when she asked like, when's the right time? I, you know, I'll give you all my cell phone numbers right now. You know, it's <laughs> it's, it's not that it's not that hard. I mean, my biggest thing that I always tell advertisers they're like, oh, we're buying on Google, we're buying on Facebook, we're buying mm -hmm. here. I said, you got to do an A B C D test. You know, it's very important, you know, take a little bit of your budget. If you're, if you're going to spend 100000 you know, test out 5000 here, 10000 here, and then and see what happens. You know, it's all about KPIs. It's all, I, I know uh, Tia just said about data scientists. You know, my company, we have data scientists behind us looking at this every single day to try to figure out how to get our advertisers better users. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's very smart to just keep on testing and test right away and try different things. I was saying to Tia, I, I don't do any incent. You know, incent is a dirty word, you know, to a lot of my advertisers. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, you know, a portion of my traffic. We're going to test it out. He works with my biggest competitor. And maybe I can build a flow behind that kind of advertisers that work for him. So it's always just, you know, test, test, test. In my opinion. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say on the call side, make sure you have someone to answer the calls. But other than that, start right away. 
<laughs> gotcha. Oh, and it, it's tied, by the way. Um, but with that being oh, said, my bad, <laughs> no worries. Um, I personally don't really believe in an all eggs in one basket approach to business. I feel like, you know, you're setting yourself up for a failure or at least for a huge disappointment when you think that way. So, you know, to echo, I'm sorry, to echo Andrew, I do believe in testing multiple things. And I think some of the partners that I work with, um, the ones who've had the, the biggest amount of success with me are those who are willing to test different things. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a very long time. I think on average, if you're running a campaign, if you're testing a campaign, you have maybe like a three to seven day window where you know if it's working. You should know if it's working. And sure. I feel like, you know, those things that are working, you do more of. Those things that aren't working, you get rid of. Um, but you have to be open to just, you know, testing multiple things. Um, I went to um, a workshop last year. I've told this story like five times already. Um, but, you know, there was a, a panel like this one. And there was a gentleman on the panel, and he was a big influencer. And the very first thing he said, um, you know, when the question was asked of him about media, he said, affiliate marketing is dead. No one's doing that anymore. And you're in a room full of affiliate marketers, and you say that. And so, you know, for me, I would never tell someone that their answer or response is incorrect, but I would challenge that to say that, you know, I feel like all things are relevant, all things are useful. It's just how you use them. You know, you have to have a strategy in whatever you do. You can be the best emailer, you can be the best affiliate marketer, but if you don't know how to implement those things in a way that kind of gets results for your client, then that just kind of speaks more so to your technique as a salesperson more so than that particular product itself. And so with that being said, I just encourage everyone to test everything, rule out nothing, but also know when to quit. Yeah, I would also say you got to make sure that you're not putting all your bread, you know, all your eggs in one basket, yep. um, as we said before, because it happened to me. I, I had all my eggs in Google and Google, you know, changed the policy and basically shut down the business. Yeah. Um, I was at dinner last night with, with a couple guys that are in this room and we were talking about you want to have everything like 15% of your business, you know, the most of the business. Um, I was talking to the FMG guys last night and, you know, they were saying most of their mobiles on the social media networks and stuff like that. You know, test different things. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know what's going to happen tomorrow when the government does something and shuts down something with Facebook. You know, I always say for myself... You know, whenever we post uh, calls out to advertisers or data, we have to follow the TCPA, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Mm -hmm. You know, we have on our side the CAN-SPAN Act of 2003 for email. I know forensics here, uh, you know, they, they do a lot, you know, with, with CAN-SPAN and TCPA and all that. Facebook, Google, they're all under the whole data thing going on in Congress and um, you never know what's going to happen next with the bigger companies and we're the smaller companies and we already have the TCPA. We already have, um, you know, can span for email. So you always want to be testing outside the giant companies. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go along with that theme of policies affecting, um, marketing and policies affecting what you do. So tell us a little bit about what the future holds for some of the work that you do, affiliate marketing and paper call, lead generation newsletters, and how that might affect the way you do business in the future. I mean, for me, it's verticals. Um, you know, we try to get in all different kinds of verticals. Mm -hmm. So for example, the biggest vertical that, you know, we just broke into is political. Um, I know we're in Canada, but the U.S. election is huge money, huge. You know, they're, they said that, that people spend in marketing around $10 billion mm -hmm. for the 2020 election. There is a lot of, you know, I didn't even know about the business until I went to a show, uh, you know, a couple months ago. Um, so I would just like look at different verticals. Yeah, I think for, for us, um, it changes depending on what verticals the customer's in, but for us, a lot of customers, they won't be able to record phone calls. So anything that captures PII, be really careful about. Um, one change in technology that could be pretty relevant for anyone doing online tracking will be the increase of, of ad blockers and, and browser extensions that, um, or browsers that block ad extensions. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we get all of our attribution information from 
uh, JavaScript that runs on a page to provide dynamic phone numbers. So um, as that, that comes, that, that does pose a threat in a lot of ways to getting that detailed attribution for phone calls for a lot of our customers. So it's something that we're aware of in trying to, to come up with solutions for um, as the landscape changes for, for ad technology. So. Is that the whole robocalls that they're talking about? Um, not the robocall thing specifically, but um, yeah, uh, what's it called? Um, if I think of it, I'll, I'll say it, but um, more more so for um, some some browsers are starting to block extensions, Got it. like mm -hmm. yeah, in cookies and tracking. Yeah. Okay. I think for me, it's just a matter of just basic compliance. Um, you know, because my relationships are third party. Um, we have to be very careful in terms of, you know, like, you know, legalities, um, you know, because we're working with partners who don't have any real ownership over the content or may not have any real ownership or, you know, um, conversation in, in, in terms of like, you know, the terms and conditions of that particular relationship. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, two or three years ago, we were doing quite well with political advertising, but then it just took one person who worked on the Trump campaign to complain on our um, corporate Twitter account, and so that got shut down, and so now we don't run any more political ads. Um, I think the new thing that we're seeing a lot of, you know, you know questioning about um, CBD um, or CBD products, and so of course with that being legalized, you know, across the country, you would think, well, if it's if it's legal in the country, it should be legal in terms of how I choose to buy it, purchase it through my device. But again, you know, the red flags that come up with that, because you know, all you know, we all know that you know the law is just kind of like subject to interpretation in most situations. And so, from a compliance perspective, we just have to make sure that we're not violating HIPAA laws, we're not, you know, violating someone's privacy. Um, so compliance is is where the biggest challenge will always be for us. Yeah. And I want to continue with asking you about, uh, you mentioned that you guys have global operations. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys deal with the differing laws within each country? So again, we have, you know, a very, you know, great legal team. So, you know, we're seven offices around the world. Um, but again, we all work from the same, you know, corporate source. So our legal um, is done across the board, our finance across the board, our compliance across the board. So it's just a matter of making sure that we hire the right people within those regions, but also making sure that as a company, we're funneling the right resources to those people. Um, but with that being said, you know, we do recognize that, you know, international laws are sometimes different, can be sometimes, you know, be challenging. But again, that's just kind of where our legal team kind of takes the lead on that. And again, we make sure that we're partnering up or hiring people in those particular regions with that level of skill or with that particular area of expertise and we're all cooperating to work in a way that you know one doesn't impact the other in a way that makes the entire good that puts the entire company at risk if that answers the question yeah. uh, Noah, I have a question for you uh, what do you think are the best strategic tips that brands should follow when marketing yeah it's a good question um, and I would I'm gonna twist it towards calls because that's kind of <laughs> where my focus would be but um, yeah, strategic tips for, for brands, I would say um, split test call flows. That would be one of the biggest things if you want to get more call conversions is the IVR, you know, where you dial into somewhere and it says, you know, for sales, press one or for service, press two. Mm -hmm. There can also be a lot of other filtering questions depending on the type of, of call flow you're going through. Um, for brands that want to start doing calls and in in even working with third party partners, mm -hmm. I'd highly recommend working with someone who's been doing calls for a long time and those partners will often come to a brand with recommendations around different types of call flows to split test, mm -hmm. different types of call treatments. Um, that would be my biggest recommendation is, is for someone who wants to get into calls um, for the first time is to, to test with some, some trusted partners and then also make sure you have technology there. So um, obviously Invoca would be some, something that can help you track and manage what you're doing but also um, in the digital space, tools like Everflow or, or other things that you know, help people track and actually measure what they're doing. And Andrew, um, so how, how does, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but I'm gonna twist it a bit. How does uh, storytelling and creative research help you in the work that you do in terms of, you've mentioned that you've just started a new vertical in policy making and uh, political work, so how does that work with you? Yeah, I mean, the best part about what we do is that we can target a user um, as far as possible. Um, you know, for example, 
I was, I was telling her before that Kamala Harris is our client, but you know, we want to make sure that we get them donators. So we're going to take them down three or four different questions to make sure that we understand where, um, you know, what user is going to work for them. Um, so when you go to storytelling, um, it's funny when I was doing click the call, when we first started it, it was always, how do you get someone to actually press the button and then it pops up in your phone and then get someone to call in and then stay on the phone for 90 seconds, 120 seconds to get paid. And it was always storytelling. It was always how to get that user engaged. So if it was a, for a free cruise, it was always, do you like to hang out in the sun? Do you like the, the ocean? Um, do you want to spend time with your family? Get them excited, get them engaged. And once you got them engaged, it's, you know, pound them with what you want. Um, so we always, you know, tell stories. You know, I have partners here that are sitting in the, in the corner over there. You know, we have like an exit solution and it, it's a back end monetization. And what we do is we make sure we know everything about the user. So the whole story about the user. So then when we, they get to that section, we can show them the right ads and they can see the, at exactly at the right time and they're going to want to click on it and they're going to want to, you know, engage mm -hmm. and it would be a good customer for them. So anything we can do to make the user a better experience for the advertiser mm -hmm. is going to work every single time. Yep. Ty, do you have any? I, I, I just want to agree with um, what he's saying about engagement because, you know, a part of our core values at TabJoy, like engagement is the E um, in core for us, um, for core values. Um, but, you know, again, our platform is designed around user engagement, right? It's one thing to show a user an ad, but it's another thing to, like, make them part of the ad experience, which then, you know, encourages them to click a box or buy a, 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 a whatever the product is that you're selling. And so I... I can't say, you know, um, enough about engagement. And for us, you know, video has been like a really um, strategic part of our engagement piece mm -hmm. um, because, you know, our users, they come, you know, they, they're playing their game. You know, they get to a level where they need to get free currency. So if they need five free ducks or if they need six, you know, golden geese or whatever, you know, at some point they're going to have to pull out their credit card and pay for that or they can engage or interact with advertising to get that same thing for free. Um, and for us, video has been a huge driver um, or, or an engagement piece. Um, and so I can't say enough about that. And so, you know, when you're thinking about your clients and when you're thinking about, you know, how you, you know, get users to go further down your funnel where you can show them more ads, you can sell them more products, again, I think most of your efforts should be put into that engagement piece that's going to entice that user and keep them coming yep. back. It's more than just, hey, can you run my offer? It's, hey, can you present my offer? Can you encourage your users to look at my offer? Can you encourage them to take an action beyond looking at the offer? Can you encourage them to buy? So the more engaged that user is on the front end, the more likely they are to complete a transaction or an action on the back end. And, and that's going to lead to your upselling model. Um, if it's, you know, on my end, you know, send them an SMS, send them a push notification, uh, having them interact in email, um, all that's going to just continue down. And they, if they like what they, you're giving them, if they want to come back, you know, return customers. It's one of our favorite things to deal with. So it's very important to, you know, be able to handle that. I agree. Uh, I recently read that uh, most most people nowadays have seven second attention span. So it's like we were talking about the video and I was thinking you literally have seven seconds to get a customer engaged with uh, whatever it is that you want them to buy or whatever it is that you want them to learn from that ad. And so I want to ask you guys, when you're thinking about marketing, mm -hmm. what what do you guys do? Like, how many seconds do you guys want to make sure that you have the, the customer? I, I mean, you look at a resume, right, where you go to hire someone. A resume gets looked at for one or two seconds, and then boom, to the next one. So it's always like, what's highlighting it? For me, it's someone's going to look at something, and now I don't even think desktop anymore. I think mobile. Yep. They're going to look at it as... What's going to make them press that submit button? So what's going to, so it's always that, I think it's within two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, that's your attention you have with them. And yeah. that's why you look at everything with Google, right? It's all tiny little ads. You look at pu push notifications now. I think it's a max of 
75 characters or something like that. You look at SMS, you know, you only have this much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your creative is very, very important mm -hmm. and you got to get someone to click. And to, to that point too, the more you hyper, um, hyper target a certain audience, your audience, the more engagement you'll, you'll hopefully get with that too. So I know mean, you mentioned even when you guys ask questions, you'll, you'll be able to then get a response that your brand will then send a direct mail piece to or something. So ways that our clients will actually find out who this person is or, or who this target customer is and then send them a, a piece that's very relevant to them, which makes them engage more. So I would say the, yeah, the other way is just making sure that you're targeting your message to the right customers sure. at the right time. Yeah, I'll echo that as well because I think targeting is so important. And you know, in terms of my industry, when you think of games or gamers, you know, most people think that it's probably like the 18-year-old college freshman sitting in his dorm room, um, when that's not true. The average gamer is female, um, 18 to 44. Um, and so we know that that particular audience is, is definitely more inclined to purchase or make, this, or make the purchasing decisions for their particular household. Um, so when we think about targeting, you know, you want to make sure that the targeting is, is in place at the very beginning, but then whatever your point of action or your point of conversion, your point of sale is, I would say you want to make sure that those things are earlier in the funnel as opposed to later because again in seven seconds you know if I'm just like really like locked in this game of words with friends or whatever and I need my six gems to get my free coupon I don't want to have to go through six pages of offers yeah. to get my six coupons because I'm I've, I've already checked out you know 20 seconds ago so targeting for sure knowing your audience most definitely but then making sure that that payable or required action is presented earlier rather than later and, and so my next question is about you guys, um, outside of what you do, what marketing channels are you guys interested in exploring further? Uh, you know, for me to, I'm very interested in this whole video business. Um, <laughs> you know, even if I was on the plane and I was playing solitaire on my phone and a, a, you know, a video came up for five seconds, sure. whatever it was, and you know, it was, I'm like, oh, someone just made money, right? Mm -hmm. um, video is definitely something I want to, you know, work at and, and get into. Um, and then for me, I still think SMS is the most, you know, the craziest, you know, play right now. Um, obviously, SMS is not new, um, but if you go to Affiliate Summit or, or LeedsCon or any of those shows, everyone's having SMS meetups right now. It was like crypto, what everyone was doing like two years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, we're very interested in SMS. We're we're getting we're spending a lot of money investing in it, and I think SMS will be the next email marketing, mm -hmm. for sure. I think for me, um, you know, I'm very much interested in influencer marketing. And again, I just go back to that same um, workshop of last year. Um, and again, I will never tell someone that their media strategy is wrong. I would just say that it might not be as effective as it could be if you packaged it correctly. Um, but with that being said, you know, I think that there is a space where influencer and affiliate can like kind of co-mingle and coexist um, and be profitable. Um, because, I mean, maybe you have an affiliate network of nothing but influencers, and so mm -hmm. that's your channel, you know? And I think, you know, um, you know, obviously we live in a world that, you know, technology is just becoming more and more of our everyday lives. You know, every single thing that we do now, you know, there's like technology to replace that or enhance it. Um, but there's always going to be a need for people. Um, and I think that, you know, people are people that have connections. They have influences. You know, they we make we hold sway over someone else's, you know, activity in some way or another. So I think that there is a way for the two to, to coexist. And I think that that's what I'm going to focus on in my future. So. Cool. And yeah, one, one area that's it's been around for a long time, but um, has been more interesting to me uh, recently is like consumer guides and um, publishers where they have aggregated a lot of information and, and have recommended solutions. So being able to, there, there's so much information out there for a consumer, so many options. If a company can really package that information well and push a consumer towards a certain uh, outcome or option, then I've seen that be really successful in, in, in the call space um, particularly as well. So those types of publisher companies that are doing a lot around um, consumer information and um, packaging it in a way that the consumer 
gets what they want easily without having to do a ton of research on their own. Mm -hmm. It seems like a, a really cool avenue um, that can grow a lot in the future. I'll just say one thing. I mean, push notifications, we're doing a lot of it. Uh, you know, my partners over there do a lot of push notifications as well. Um, you know, I know a couple of companies here, I run them on push as well. Push notifications came out, what, two years ago, two and a half years ago? It's a Google product, um, but everyone's doing it. I mean, you know, you, you're on ESPN.com, they have push notifications. Obviously, we use it differently for marketing purposes. Mm -hmm. They use it for content, which is all marketing anyway. It's going to, you know, they want someone to look at an ad. Um, but I would recommend every single person, if you don't have push notifications on your site, you know, you put it on your site. Um, you know, we looked at it as free money. It didn't hurt our conversion rates at all. Um, but it's, I think it's going to get bigger and bigger. And Google hasn't really regulated it yet, mm -hmm. um, like they've done with everything else. But <laughs> we'll see what happens. And so imagine that you have a new client. They're a brand new brand, right? They're a brand new business, but they just don't have that marketing budget that you, you, know, you typically work with. What would your advice be to them? What would you tell them to start off with? Um, let's start with Noah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. Since, since, since we're a technology platform, if someone came to us and didn't really have a lot of budget, um, you know, we, would, we would say, hey, here's the tool, and, and this is what it's going to cost you. And if, if you guys have expertise in any certain channel of marketing, mm -hmm. focus on that and get the biggest ROI on that first. Um, yeah, we're, we're not going to get too involved in recommending channels for them since we're more the technology provider. So I'll let one of these guys jump mm -hmm. into that more. I mean, for me, um, it's a question that comes up quite often. Our platform is self-serve by design. So, you know, if you go to tabjoy.com, you know, you can create an account. Um, you will have limited functions in terms of what you can see and view through the dashboard, but it is designed for you to, you know, build your campaign. You can test, um, you can prepay with a credit card. Um, but what we find with that is for most of the bigger clients, you know, they want that added human touch. They want that level, like they want a dedicated rep. They want someone that they can ask questions of in that moment. They need help with tracking. They need help with, um, you know, setting up creative. They need help with like, you know, change changing bids, adjusting payouts, all of those things. And those are things that, you know, you know, for, I'm not gonna really be so inclined to take that on for a $250 test. That's something that I'll do for my $10,000 or more test guy, right? So I think that, you know, you just have to look at that particular opportunity and see what it means for you in this moment, but also what that might mean for you six months from now, a year from now. And if the opportunity looks like it's promising enough, then maybe you take that chance and you set them up on a test. Um, you know, for some clients, you know, we will extend terms to them, um, you know, at a particular dollar minimum. Um, and it's not a commitment to spend to the penny. It's just to say that, you know, we're working towards this particular spend goal. And if I can help you get there quickly, then let's work towards that. But again, you know, every opportunity might not, might not be the best opportunity for you, or it just might not be the right time. So I would say just consider the opportunity opportunity and then use your best judgment, but also make sure that that judgment is ROI positive and not ROI negative. Yes, yes. So. Andrew? Uh, you know, depending on what the, the brand is and if something I believe in personally, I'll work with them and do a free test. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, give them a thousand leads, right. see what they can do with it, um, partner with them somehow, you know, do all the creative, you know, do everything and, you know, see how we can make it work. Yeah, sounds good. I'd like to thank the panel, and I want to actually open it up for questions to the audience now. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, and we'll come to you with our mic. The mic's not working. Is this one working? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Give me just a Hi, this is Jen. Um, I noticed that you guys had mentioned SMS and push notifications a lot, and I think one thing is how do you toe that line between becoming intrusive where the where people may perceive your brand negatively because they think it's spam versus you know engaging someone who's actually interested in the product it's a great question um, you know I think there's got to be testing done um, you know for example on my sites we can basically let the user know that they're going to receive SMS messages or push messages um, from this brand. 
so they're aware of it and it's not spam. Um, but you know, you got to do testing and you can't be so aggressive. I mean, when you get these short codes, um, or long codes, you, it's not like email marketing that you can send out a hundred to an inbox. You know, it's more of you, you would send out one a day and then 48 hours, eight hours, you would send out another one. Mm -hmm. So I think you just got to test and understand how many you can send. I know a lot of people that send 10 push notifications a day. Um, you know, my company, we send three a day, um, unless they click on it, then we know they're, you know, they trigger a new one. Um, you know, I know Mark over here, raise your hand, Mark. <laughs> Marco, Mark over there, Mark. Yeah, they, they, they do a lot of push notifications. Um, they have a very good science in it. So I would definitely you know, speak with them later. So uh, I thought it was interesting. You were saying that females from 18 to 44 are, are the, you know, gaming more. Uh, actually, as, as someone with a couple of kids who's, uh, who are always borrowing their mom's phone to play games, mm -hmm. I, I wonder how skewed that statistic is. But, but I, I wonder, you know, like, is there any way to really understand who's using, like who the real audience is of, of these apps? That's a good question. Um, and it's funny because, you know, for our targeting uh, controls on our end, you know, um, our age categories begin at 13. So 13 to 17, then 18 plus. Um, and so, yeah, you're right, you know, depending on who has the device in their hand at that particular moment. But I think, you know, in terms of the feedback that we get from our clients with regards to quality, um, you know, um, retention rates, um, you know, cancellations, I feel like, you know, if it were all kids or mostly kids, and, and we get some positive results from all of those, by the way. Um, and so I think that just kind of lends itself to saying that, you know, the audience that we think we're getting is, is I would say eight times out of 10, what we are getting. Um, but again, that's where client feedback kind of takes the lead in that. Um, because, you know, again, if it's just kids just playing around on mom or dad's phone, um, you know, and then they mess around and they buy, you know, a six month bark box subscription, <laughs> you know, if mom cancels in three days then we know that mom didn't really want that bark box, you know, subscription. But I think, you know, again, that's where you just kind of like rely on your end client to to support or debunk the results. If that answers your question. Uh, I'll ask a question to Ty. How do you sell around in scent um, to these brands, advertisers that, you know, when, an, when a brand says, oh, you're going to incentivize my user, mm -hmm. you know, to buy my product or to use my game, you know, are they going to like it? Or are they going to keep it? Because you know, the so, way I look at incent a lot of times and they come to me, sure. they say it's, yeah, you know, it's dirty. It's, you know, they're going to cancel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So that happens. And, and again, you know, we're not exactly incentivizing the, the sale of your product. You know, we're incentivizing the experience. So what happens is a user is playing a game and that game, you know, has the Tabjoy offer wall inside of it, right? So, you know, in the agreement that we have with our publishers and our publishers are all developers or, you know, they're all like, you know, the app itself. We're not taking traffic from, you know, network A and blending it with traffic from network C and X, Y, Z and all that in the middle, right? So, you know, again, the understanding is that, you know, a user is going to choose to engage. It's not intrusive because my user is choosing to engage with your brand or your product because they know that they're, they're going to get those five gems, those six ducks, whatever it is that they're going to get and we want to encourage them to continue on to purchase but we can't force them to purchase um, but what we do we do some soft encouragement and that you know we will in our instruction page to the user we'll say you know register with a valid email address but you must do x y and z after that to get the rewards now what they don't know is that they got the rewards when they submitted their email address but in their thinking they're not getting those rewards until they purchase subscribe sign up for a free trial whatever no cancellations allowed within the first 15 to 30 days so we can use certain verbiage to encourage but again we can never force force the actual purchase. Um, but that, that has worked for us. Um, and particularly um, when we run campaigns on a, um, 
a cost per click basis because there's no real tracking involved in that because you know the user is incentivized or they get their reward as soon as they click from the banner in the offer wall. But again, Got we it. put the messaging in front of them that says you won't get your rewards until you do all of these other things. And that works for us. Got it. That's right. Any other questions? I'm just curious for uh, push notifications. Have you guys tried calls in any way? Or does that work in that channel? So we, we haven't tried calls yet. Um, the push software we use right now, it's tough to, because it's, it's, it pushes Android or Chrome. So it's 15% you know, desktop, 85% uh, mobile. Um, we've tested apps, you know, we got a little success, hasn't, you know, hasn't really worked as much, but we know we haven't really tested calls, but it's something that we should test. Yeah. And we have clients doing that today. I don't have good metrics to share though, um, but I, I think it is successful for, for certain clients. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I think we have time for about two. Morning guys. Um, Morning. It's interesting just to hear on your side, like um, the sort of different strategies that work internationally. Like, I'd be interested to hear, like, you know, are gamers different in the Far East or paper call in Europe or email, how GDPR has affected you and the international sort of side of how those strategies play so, out? So just for me, I'm US only. Um, for the reason I used to do a lot of work in Canada, then you guys, did the verify privacy, whatever it was, and it's not worth it. Um, same thing in the UK. To me, it wasn't worth it. Um, but if we go to the next country I feel like I would go into is either India or Australia, uh, just from what I understand out there. But email marketing is tough in other countries, especially as you said. So I'll, I'll move the question on because I'm uh, US. Yeah. I don't really have any, uh, uh, you know, specific answer to that question. You know, again, we're a global company. We have teams in all of those regions, and those teams, you know, have their verticals that they specialize in. Me, I am more U.S. only. Also, I do have some relationships with U.K. partners, but because we have a U.K. team, um, you know, it kind of creates some internal conflict because, you know, there are certain verticals that they can run in the U.K. that we can't run here in the U.S., for example. Like, I can't do any type of, like, gambling um, or casino-type offers, but those things are allowed and acceptable in the U.K., you know, in our Asia market, you know, it's mostly gamers um, and, and mostly, you know, app development. So, you know, I don't run app campaigns. Those guys are there to service that. Although we do have a team in the U.S. to, to service that particular type of client um, in our Asia, um, our Asian market, you know, it's pretty much, you know, a, a free for all, if you will. And, you know, we're trying to bring those guys on board in a way that, you know, we're not stepping over each other's toes. You know, it depends on, you know, if that company is a U.S., uh, I'm sorry, a U.S. based company, but they're marketing through like the Asian territories or the, um, the U.K. territory or Canadian territory. It just depends. But again, you know, I try to focus only on the things that are here in the U.S. And for, for calls, we're US, Canada, and UK. There's, it, for some reason, it's pretty much only the US that really does a lot of paper call. Uh, the UK is, has a smaller market, but it is, it is growing. And then I've heard, um, I've heard about companies trying to get something started in continental Europe and also in Australia uh, around calls. I think that's it. Well, I'd like to thank you gentlemen for joining me on this panel and I really appreciate everybody's time. And yeah, they'll be available for any questions after this panel, but thank you so much. Thank you.